And action! Hello and welcome to episode 327 of the Filmmakers Podcast. This is a podcast where we talk filmmaking, how to get them made, how to get your films out there and get seen by everyone. And we talk to loads of people, filmmakers all around the world of how they have done that to help you go out there and do exactly that. Get your films seen, heard and loved by your audiences. I am Giles Alderson. I'm a writer, director and a producer. Three Day Millionaire is still in the top charts on Netflix UK right now. Go support if you haven't already. I'd love it. And if you have watched it uh, recently, please go on IMDb and give it some love. Please go on Amazon and do exactly the same. It takes you seconds and it's so easy to do and it means so much to the filmmaker. Do that with every guest who's been on this podcast. If you watch the film, give it some love. It takes seconds and like I say, it means so much. On today's episode, we have Marley Elfman. She is a fantastic writer-director uh, and also a BAFTA-nominated producer um, who started her career making the micro-budget feature film Do Not Disturb. Since then, she's produced many films, including Karen Gillan's directorial debut, The Party's Just Beginning, Mike Flanagan's Before I Wake, uh, and The Ashram, which stars Melissa Leo. She has recently completed her directorial debut, the feature film, Next Exit. It is a really, really, really cool movie. It's indie, it's fun, it's thought-provoking, and I really, really like this movie. Um, it stars Katie Parker, Rahul Kohli, and Karen Gillan, but it is Katie Parker and Rahul Kohli's film. It's a road trip movie. It's basically those two uh, on a road trip across the US so they can partake in a scientist's radical experiment with the afterlife. Oh yeah. Um, myself and Dom Lenoir sat down with Marley and we talked all about what it's like when you're jaded as a filmmaker and how you can move yourself forward. How she fell into producing and what it's like running a set. She talks about writing and the benefits of doing so. And she gives you some amazing film festival tips. She also describes what she learnt by going from a producer to a director. Why she wanted to shoot in order. And why worrying doesn't work. Coming up on Tuesday's episode is Nathaniel Martella White and his feature film, The Strays, which has been at number one on the Netflix chart for the last week or so. Knocking off Three Day Millionaire. Um, hasn't knocked it off, it just, Three Day Millionaire didn't get above it <laughs> in the charts, but it still is in the charts. Go watch it, go support. Um, uh, so that is next Tuesday. And then on Friday, we have Saim Sadiq's amazing um, drama. Joyland. But without any further ado, without any more bump, let's get to today's chat with myself, Juzzles, uh, Dom Lenoir and Marley Elfman talking all about filmmaking and her feature film Next Exit, which is available now. Go watch it, go support. For now though, sit back, relax. Think about filmmaking. Think about your films and getting them made. Be inspired and enjoy this week's Filmmakers Podcast. Hello. Hello. How are you? I realize that next to me are power washing their house. I thought it was a lawnmower. It's not. Can you hear any of that? Is it okay? It sounds okay. They're literally power washing. I'm sitting here because I can see them straight out my window right in front of me. And I thought it was a lawnmower. And I was like, they have been mowing their lawn for so long. And all of a sudden I see this. I'm on the second floor and I see a person walk by. And I'm like, well, that's weird. I don't think they're mowing the roof. And then I realized they're power washing their house. Wow. Perfect time for Perf this type of stuff. What more do you want when you're going to record a podcast than that? What's that? That's right? amazing. Dom will join us soon, I imagine. I'm sure he will. Um, but how are you? How's things going? Obviously, um, we're here to talk about Next Exit. But you, you know what I mean? You've, your career is fantastic. You produce so many amazing films. How are you feeling right now in terms of everything? What's, what's, what's the feel for you as a filmmaker to sort of be in that stage 
I think tired is right now. No, I just got back from Sundance yesterday. Oh my gosh, did you? Yes, you will be tired then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sundance is always exhausting. Uh, consistently is, always was, uh, still is now being back in person. Uh, I haven't done a festival that many days, that much stuff in the snow for a little while. So that was exhausting. But honestly, I feel really good. <laughs> uh, I think the thing that is the most surprising to me is, uh, and heartening is all of these things that I've cared about for so many years and for so long and have been trying to make uh, are all kind of coming together at the same time. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, all Birth Rebirth is a project I've been on for seven years. Next Exit I was on for, you know, been trying to make for eight years before we actually made it. It's 10 years altogether. So wow. none of these are new ideas. And it just happens to be that maybe I've gotten to a certain point of my career or people are more accepting to the types of ideas that I was always trying to pitch. I don't know, combination thereof. Uh, but it's it's really nice to finally see all the work starting to pay off a little bit. Mm. Yeah, no, I it, doesn't it, always do that. <laughs> no, no, totally. Same for me as well. It's like the last five years have suddenly been, oh, it's happening. All oh, right, all that ten years before yeah. the build up of the pressure, the pain, the disappointment, you suddenly feel like you learn from that massively, and you go, oh, okay. It, it's still really hard, but it you, you can manage that hardness a bit better, right? Yes. Is that, does, is that what it feels like when you know when you made your debut film, you know, Do Not Disturb, was because. I don't know, there's something about making your first film now looking back that was so freeing, but you didn't realize it at the time. Is that how it felt for you? Yeah, I uh, I mean, do not disturb. We shot that in six days for 30K. It yeah, was really just, it. I didn't know what I didn't know yet. I, I didn't know how stupid I was. Yes, uh, that's basically <laughs> it, isn't it? Yes, you don't know how stupid we are. <laughs> I, Whenever people come to me now and they want to make their first film like that, I'm like, don't ask somebody like me because now I'm far too jaded. I've done too. I know too many things now. I can't go back. Go be stupid. Be safe. Yeah. Get insurance is always the thing that I say. Please. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's the but, big thing. But it's true. We do get we get jaded and we get jaded in a good way. But we, I suppose we get, like I say, hardened. I think we were talking about almost the same word. We just get yeah. used to things bouncing off us a bit more. Oh, that project took a massive dive today. Oh, that actor's not doing it anymore. Oh, that money yep. fell through. We just kind of go, okay, cool. All right, pick ourselves up, have a moment, and we're back on it. When we first start, exactly. it's the worst in the world. It's like, I've worked so hard for this, and it's all just falling apart around me. Yeah. Yeah, I remember crying before over not getting into yeah. film festivals. And I'm like, okay, next. Okay, what's our strategy? It's so much more strategic. and Yeah. Yeah, he, you, you're used to it. it. It's also not, I mean, not to say that all of this isn't personal to me because it's all very personal and all very important. But not every rejection is rejecting me. It's understanding that there is more to it that people are looking for and why they say yes or no. Yes. Yeah, what do you think it is now then? about you but look in all honesty i loved next exit i thought it was fantastic it's it's one of those where you go okay it's a road movie i kind of think i know what i'm expecting and it didn't go there it didn't go where i thought it was going to go and it became this really emotional wonderful drama about people about human relationships and the feeling of when you're going down a certain route and you got your mindset on it kind of like filmmaking in a way i will make this film and then it falls apart that's what was happening in your film and it was beautiful it was so fantastic we'll come back to that um sorry oh, i did oh, oh, thank you i appreciate that no let's stay there yeah. <laughs> you know like you said there you know you, you get to the point where things do change what do you think yeah. it is that 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 made things change for you what's the mindset like now when you're going right i want to make next exit how is it you go okay how can i do this what do you do at the very beginning well you know one thing that i'll just say to that is that i was trying to make right after do not disturb i was trying to make this film um i was looking for a director it's funny because you huh. see me credit mike flanagan because i was trying to get mike flanagan to direct it Back wow. in the day, we had met, I made Do Not Disturb, he made Absentia, we met at a film festival and said we wanted to work together. Mm -hmm. uh, he was going down a different route and a different, you know, we ended up making Before I Wake together and some other films. And basically, I had gone to my planning and I was trying to find a director. And so, first of all, it wouldn't have been directed by me. And it wasn't until years later when Mike was like, you direct this. This is your story. This is your thing. You need to be doing this. And I was like, mm -hmm. what? I hadn't even thought of that. Really? But also, You hadn't thought of directing? Was that never sort of 
on your mind to go, I must direct this. No, no it wasn't. And then I also, I knew from my experience, I was like, I need to go direct some shorts. And like, I need to get, I, I don't even know if I can direct. And so I took the risk of, of starting to work in short films, which I think is the best place for aspiring filmmakers to see what they could do. And honestly, mm -hmm. the first one was meh. Second one, a little bit better. A yeah, little bit more. Then, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I look back and I'm like, well, you did something. Uh, and then you by shot the something. That's the thing yeah. with making a short. You make things. God, you, until you've made something, you don't realize the mistakes you can make and you learn so much from it, especially the editing yeah. process. Absolutely. And you also learn, oh, this is what was in my head and this is why I didn't accomplish that. How do I get what's in my head accomplished on screen? And you get better at that and you get more and more trusting of that. And then I finally made uh, my short about my grandma, uh, Do You Believe in Ghosts? Mm -hmm. uh, and that was one that I was really proud of. Uh, and I was... I started to actually understand how to hone something in an emotion, a feeling, because all of my work is very emotionally driven. It's not super plot driven. Yeah. And uh, so that is when I started to feel more confident uh, about going out with this, with me as the director. Uh, but it, it took a little bit of time. And I'm also really glad that I didn't do it at the beginning because I feel like when I was younger, I would have been so stressed out every single day. I would have been so worried about proving myself. I would have been so worried about people are judging me and I didn't really, I, I didn't, I didn't really give a fuck what people thought. I, you know, I, I hope that this film reaches out, but I didn't make this film being like, I hope they like me. I made this film because I was like, this is very important to me. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I, if I remember those intentions, I remember why I wrote this and I remember what this script gave me in terms of hope, hopefully that can reach out to some people. And I know that that's not a traditional storytelling. And I know that that was never going to be like a mass audience necessarily. But I also knew that the people who needed this and the people who it would resonate with would resonate with that. And so I just had to be honest and truthful. And so I really went into this being like, I wonder if I'm going to fail massively. I mean, that could happen. And mm -hmm. that's okay because I'm going to come out of this stronger and no more. And it wasn't until like the second to last day when I was, had my editor on set and I was watching stuff and it was actually working. And people were actually like, this is really good that I started to get nervous because I was like, oh shit, what if I actually made something good? And that actually terrified me more than just taking a risk and kind of going for it. Hello. Hello. <laughs> This is Dom Lenoir, by the way. Hey, Dom. This is Marley Elfman. Hey, yeah. Uh, I liked what you were saying about sort of making films for people, because that's that's kind of why I got into films. Is you know, I go and see a film, and that it, it resonates with a, a specific kind of emotion or thing that you need to think about or deal with. Yeah. And then you do the same when you create a film. You're giving someone the gift of being able to process or reevaluate something. I mean, has that always been a, a driving force in, you know, wanting to go into film in the sort of like the very early formative years? Yeah, I, I there's so many films that get made and there's so many things that it's hard to cut through the no noise. And when you're trying to package these films and everybody's like, oh, you have to have these elements in order to be successful. Mm. And it, it does this. And if you hit all these beats and and honestly, I think one of the challenges with my work is that I don't necessarily hit a lot of those like trackers it's like I, i'm not i don't know that netflix algorithm necessarily loves me because i don't know that I'm, <laughs> I'm always like checking all the right boxes um but what's important to me in the films that i always have loved and have inspired me are the ones that take me on an emotional ride and one that i wasn't mm. necessarily expecting and i would rather try to make a film that has an effect on whatever message i'm going after than just make a film in which the beats are all there in order uh, I appreciate those films. I sometimes love watching those films, but for me, artwork and filmmaking, and you know, I also work in immersive uh, entertainment mm -hmm. and other types of forms. I just want to make something that is good for people <laughs> in some way, yeah. shape, or form. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be personal, and I think that's a that's a very good point. And I think there are certain shows on on Netflix that I absolutely love, uh, and on, on any streamer. Uh, but there's other ones where you look at it and you just think this has been this has been sort of factory made to you know serve some kind of intellectual idea and, and it doesn't feel authentic all the time yeah. um and, and i think i think that's sometimes what's lacking in it when there's so much work out there is is the stuff that does resonate and and that is what hooks you um at the end of the day yes I so, hope. What, and on that what was it that wanted to make you get into producing in the first place because that was your like you've said your way in and obviously you've carried on and directed four shorts and now this fantastic feature no exit but what was it about producing that you know made you want to do it uh it didn't i didn't want to produce i wasn't trying to produce uh i was actually a horse i was a 
a horseback rider and a horseback riding trainer, believe it or not. Wow. Um, okay. And wow. my my first credit, if you actually look it up, is in Black Beauty as a stunt pony rider. First time wow. in the movie business. Congratulations trained, for that. I trained Mary Legs. <laughs> horses Horse for courses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, honestly, and I, I wanted to be a writer. Uh, and I was right. actually a journalist for years through the first, it, you know, making movies, you don't really get to make movies for a very long time. And so I was actually mm. a journalist for the first six, seven years that I was trying to make films. And I was trying to write. Uh, so I wanted to be a writing writer was kind of my goal. Uh, and I was uh, a trainer for Missy Stabile, uh, who is actually a not big a producer. Mm. Not, not a horse. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> human being. Yeah. Uh, she's this badass, you know, yeah. not very tall woman who uh, <laughs> just used to run a set. And one day, you know, I was teaching her and she was like, you make a good producer. And I was like, I don't even know what that means. Uh, and she's like, come and work for me. And I was like, right. I, you know, I needed money. It was the summer between, you know, yeah. while I was in college. And so I, I worked on The Ring 2, which was actually my first job ever. Uh, yes. And I would teach her in the morning. So we'd go out at like 5 a.m. and we'd ride horses and I'd get a teacher. And then I'd go to set all day. And I loved it. It was like the time of my life. And I got incredibly addicted to the chaos energy of set and mm. running a set. And Watching her run a set was, she was always so calm, she always so level-headed, and I remember being so enamored with what she was able to accomplish, and how she put all the pieces together and maintained them running, and, and that was really the start. I was like, actually, this is my skill. My skill is finding, looking at the intention of what a piece of art needs, and then finding the right people to do it, and then empowering them throughout the process to be able to accomplish that, mm -hmm. and I liked that. That was fun. And so that's what got me into it. Uh, and then believing that I actually had something to say would come another decade later, because that's also really hard. Yeah, it is. What, what so were hard. the what yeah. what were the differences um, in terms of what you started, you know, in the sort of journalism type uh, writing, and then going into narrative? Like, what what were some of the lessons and differences um, and benefits from going one into the other? Well, one of the things that I think I'm really grateful for journalism for is you have a deadline and you have to hit it. Like, there's no other option, and it has to be a certain number of characters, and you're you're you don't have a choice. And I think a lot of young filmmakers get into, oh, I just want to explore whatever I want to explore. And it's like, no, you need to hit these markers. No, this is your audience for this. No, this there, there is understanding that there is an audience that is going to read your work and that there's something that they're looking to get out of it and that you have to accomplish that. I think was actually really important for un for later on working on scripts because again, you need to make it personal. You need to make it something about you, but you also have to stay, understand that you're writing in a medium or creating in a medium that is for other people to perceive it and for to digest it. And so I do think that that was actually very important. And also I went to all the film festivals. I was at Sundance, I was at TIFF, I was at Trib, I was watching everything. I was, I was thinking about everything. And I think that that's just so important for filmmakers is just to be aware of what filmmaking is trying to say. Out of all the American festivals, for, for people that say are in the UK and they're wondering which festival is a really good one, um, you know, maybe if you're sort of starting on your first feature or you're trying to sort of move up to something else, what do you recommend out of the sort of American Canadian festivals to go to? Like if you had to sort of pick like one or two. Um, as a journalist or as a on? filmmaker? As a filmmaker. Uh, as in just to go to and watch? Yeah, well, just to meet, to meet filmmakers, mm, really. The best yeah. one that's useful, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, that's hard, man. Um, you can do uh, a top three. I mean, you don't have to give it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you must give us the best one. Yes. I mean, look, what's interesting is if you go to Toronto or Sundance, or one of those, you're going to a huge festival with tons of filmmakers. I used to go to Sundance every single year. What's nice about Sundance is everybody's trapped in this cold place inside. And so it's very easy to other people over a, a drink or a cup of cocoa or whatever it might be for you, right? So that, that's very easy. I also really love some of the smaller film festivals. Mm. And especially for me, the genre film festivals. Uh, for me, a very formative festival was the Overlook Film Festival, mm. uh, okay. which was formerly the Stanley Film Festival. Uh, my friends over at Spectrovision actually were like, you have to go to this film festival. And I, I was like, what is this thing? I'd never even heard of it. Don't overlook it. Yeah, there you go. Oh, that he's here all week. Line. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but like, 
it was like a summer camp for horror nerds. Like, I, I don't know how else to put it. Like, but it was, I, I met so many people that I've worked with since then at that festival. And it, it was just, it was also a really bonding experience. There was a horror immersive experience. We were running around, you know, chasing a cult person at 3 a.m. and digging up graves. Mm -hmm. So it was a bonding experience. But, uh, you know, there's Chattanooga, there's Sitches, there's uh, Fantastic Fest. Fantasia is one of my favorite festivals that I've ever played at, uh, at as a filmmaker. I This film was, I, honestly, it's the last time I've watched this movie and I think it will be the last time that I ever watch Next Exit because it's never played better. Everybody was mm -hmm. so kind and it was so much fun. It was such a good time. So I, I was like, this is great. I'm done. Peace. I'm only going to judge my work from now on. I'm no longer being productive. I need to walk away. <laughs> but that was also an amazing time. I met a lot of filmmakers. So I know that was more than three. Okay. And that's fine. And just while right. we're on yeah. film festivals, uh, what tips have you learned? What's been a good thing for producers and directors to do either there or before they get there? Oh, God, that's hard. Um, I, I mean, see as many movies as you can and talk to people and yeah. be nice. Don't be an asshole. I mean, also, that's my big rule mm. about filmmaking in general. <laughs> that's a good start. <laughs> There's a the best start. General, don't be an asshole. It, yeah. It really, yeah. it really kind of is, though, because honestly, mm. I work with people who I like working with. I have to be in hell. I'm working really long days. I'm working weekends. I'm having really hard conversations. I want to do that with people who I want to be around. So, I mean, just having a good working dynamic with somebody is actually imperative to your future in this film business. So, and trust me, this world is so tiny once you get into it. All of us producers, we all know each other. And if you are an asshole, you get like ousted pretty quickly. Like we mm -hmm. just, it's, it's, you know, and we, it's a pretty clear uh, process that happens. But yeah, it doesn't take long. Does no, it? it doesn't. Moving back to producing directing then, what, what did you learn? Uh, as a producer that you took to directing especially with next exit being you know a feature film it's your debut obviously you've made a load of brilliant shorts all very successful in their own right but obviously making a feature is different and you're directing it yeah. what did you learn from the producing side that you brought to your directing one is just the stamina of what it takes to get through a feature film um mm. and you know at the end of the days i wasn't i mean it was covid so it was hard we couldn't really go out anyways um but I really sure. rest in between um, giving yourself yeah. a moment to let your brain recharge because you do just get the decision fatigue where you get to the end of the day mm. and you're just not making necessarily good choices. I remember it was after the first day of shooting and it had been so chaotic getting everything ready. Day one was as always such chaos uh, and we were in Kansas City. It dropped under four degrees Fahrenheit, which is very Oof. cold Celsius. I don't know what that is. Sorry. Uh, it's cold. It's very cold. Uh, literally, <laughs> our, our first AC, her hands froze and we had to stop for 30 minutes because she got frostbite. Like it was it was too oh, cold to be whoa. shooting. And so yeah. we didn't get everything that we needed. And everybody was like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I was like, couldn't focus. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to go. I'll talk to you all in an hour. And they were like, no, we need. And I was like, give me an hour. And I just sat and sure enough, 10 minutes later, just sitting there doing nothing, listening to nothing, anything. I was like, this is what we're going to do. This is we're gonna, how we're going to stitch this together. And I just called my producer and I said, da, 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 and we just did that. Here's the solution. But being quiet, asking for a moment, which it always mm. feels like you can't, but actually you move faster when you have a clear plan of action and knowing instead of giving everybody immediately what they wanted, if I said, let me think this through. And then I thought about the effects of what I was saying. And then I could give them a much more in-depth answer 10 minutes later was always actually a much faster way of working. Uh, and so not always feeling the pressure in the moment. I think that's a really, really, really good advice. I mean, I think especially about, I, I think sometimes when you when you go and when you've done basic or sort of medium prep, but you're well rested, you'll be able to adapt to what changes anyway. If you go in extremely prepped with zero sleep, you'll, you'll be a, a bit of a wreck. Um, and it's, it's the same, I mean, the amount of times on set when, you know, someone's bearing down, you know, saying like, hey, you've got 10 minutes, you've got 20 minutes left, uh, you have to decide something now. But then you create this kind of panic that expands to all departments and everyone's panicking and no one's really thinking about the, the calm solution. And it's it's the most unintuitive, but it's the most important decision is, is just to take a time out and, and actually just relax and keep that calm and focus. Exactly. Um, on set i mean how do you how do you sort of deal with 
you know the, the the sort of making the day and making the scenes are you are you quite pragmatic if if something goes over do, do you how do you sort of find the balance with that i don't believe in going into overtime so the only time that we did overtime was scheduled ot like when we had the void we only had mm. that void for that day so we we had right. to shoot everything out in i think we did a 14 hour day that day but you told your crew like you said you, everyone knows this is a scheduled overtime day so everyone's aware of it exactly. okay cool mm interesting plan, yeah. you know plan your child care dog care whatever care you need mm -hmm. to sort out in order to get through this day but yeah, i really self-care yeah self-care is actually incredibly mm -hmm. important and when you establish that early on it allows your crew to know that when when you say something that they can listen to it and they can follow through with that that you're not going to screw them over later on um mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. you know i'm pretty aware throughout the day because of producing like how i'm breaking up a day where i want to spend my energy where the emotional scenes are so like here, I'm going to take an hour to get through a quarter of a page here. I'm going to get through two pages in you know, 30 minutes, because this is actually just dialogue and improv. And we set up the camera once. And so, you know, look, what I have loved more time and more angles and, and being able to cover a scene properly. There's a few scenes in this film that I actually got to cover properly. The Heather scene when they get to Heather's house, I actually had the time to shoot that scene. So it's one of my favorites because I'm like coverage. Wow, that's special. <laughs> Um, but I knew going into this that that was always going to be a challenge. That was going to be the way that I wasn't going to have enough time. And I didn't fight that. I think when directors get in and they get anxious about that, you create more problems. So instead, I was like, we got to keep moving. We got to keep the flow. That's why we did the type of camera movements that we did. And I really leaned the style into the practicality of the shoot for that reason. So it was something that I was aware of beforehand. So we crafted it from you know the start that way. And it works really well. Um, do you want to give us a little pitch for next exit, and then we'll drop the trailer in? Oh God! Uh, <laughs> I can read what it says here if you no, like. No, no, no. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> it's never easy to do it. Actually, it's Absolutely. one of those things that it isn't easy, because especially if you haven't done it for a while or whatever as well. But also, when you're pitching the film, and it's yeah. so important to do this with an investor or a, you know, mm. an actor or whatever, you've got to say it off the cuff really well I know. and it's sometimes really hard to do to get it oh yeah we're not particularly judgmental on pictures no we don't a... yeah we're, we're just <laughs> yeah. we don't mind but oh, yeah. so, we'll, we'll, yes. we'll be fine no yeah, yeah. i'm trying to think i mean what is next exit <laughs> next exit is a story in which we have scientifically proven that ghosts are real and two people who are both having issues in their own life decide to cross over with the help of this new doctor and on the road trip across the country, they encounter a number of people who kind of inspire them in different directions to deal with the monsters that they've been dealing with themselves. And there you go. Smashed it. Uh, you smashed it. <laughs> it is irrefutable. Our consciousness continues beyond our physical bodies. My life beyond study is strictly a volunteer program. So why can some people see ghosts? The strong connection between Rio and his father brought them together and the rest as well history in the making. Teddy and I are taking a trip. I really needed to see you before we go. Where are you going? Well, it's difficult to say. Well, this is supposed to be goodbye. No, oh, I'll, I'll come back and haunt you. <laughs> are you two together? Excuse me? She should be so lucky. When's your appointment? Seven days. Mine's in five. Well, uh, maybe we could help each other. Been killing each other. Well, uh, no, getting to Dr. Stevenson's. Let me make something really clear to you. We're not buddies, we're not pals, we're not in this together, okay? Alex, how many people know what it's like to be us right now? At our institute, we now bridge dozens of new participants daily from this world to the next. Once you're in a state of passing, then we terminate your physical form. So, are you asking people to end their lives? I'd say this is a beginning for some. So what made you want to volunteer for the doc? I don't want to talk about that stuff. You know that every time you disappear, another little piece of my heart breaks. I don't want to hate life. I want to embrace what's next. I mean, it's not just the end. It's the beginning. I lost everyone. I never even had anyone. But I did. You can stop. I see it. This darkness. And it's irresistible. King or a queen for you folks? Two rooms, please. The further apart, the better. Oh, if you find me dead in the morning, she did it. Be sure to thank her for me.
And what a great trailer as well. It's absolutely fantastic. Mm. Thank you. The UK trailer is the one that I got to cut from the other one. So the US trailer was the one that Magnolia did, yeah. Oh, really? It, it's funny, isn't it? We always have like a US and a UK trailer or, or mm. a European trailer, depending on which sort of sales agents and distributors. Yes. And there's usually one that sort of says, we're going to do it our way. And there's usually one that lets you do it your own way. And it's there's such a personal thing in cutting your own trailer or, or supervising your own trailer. <laughs> And that's the one that we always send out to everyone. And yeah, then the other one's always. the one that just goes out to whatever the territory wants because yep. let them have what they want. But, you know, that's kind of what's yeah. most important. Yeah. It is. So to dive um, into Next Exit then, you know, mm. wh why did you want to make this project? What was it about it that you felt like, oh, 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 this is the story I want to tell as my debut movie? I, you know, it. this is a film that I was trying to make for years and it was a film that every single time that I had some type of tragedy, some type of thing that I couldn't deal with in my life, I went back to the script. Mm -hmm. And that was multiple times, multiple losses, and then at the top of COVID, uh, I was I was very stressed. I did not do well. Uh, you know, when everything mm -hmm. first went down, I think we now have this whole other experience of COVID and it's a completely different thing, but those first couple of weeks yeah. were for me at least, were absolutely terrifying. I, I didn't know if it was the zombie mm. apocalypse and the end of the world. I was hiding yep. away. I had gone up to my, my family's house and we said, oh, let's just go there for a week until this whole thing like blows over. And it was... <laughs> if I know. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> uh, a number of weeks later, and I was, I was really depressed and I, I picked up the script and I went back into it. And what was funny is that it was so much more relevant and timely because it is a world in which one thing changes and then people's perception of their own ideas change. Some of them do, mm -hmm. some of them don't, but it became so much more relevant. And uh, so I went back into the script and I was working on it and I met an investor at the time who said that she wanted to make a film. And I had all these other ones that are, honestly were much more packaged in the way that you're supposed to package a film, right? Yeah. And she read this one and she goes, I want to make that one. And I said, that one? Nobody wants to make that. That's like the riskiest one of all. And I think it really is because <laughs> it doesn't firmly fit into a genre because it isn't necessarily always the easiest to market. I always knew that was the case because as you were saying at the beginning of this, it is an emotional journey that you have to buy into. And I'm a first time feature director who can trust mm, me with mm, that. And mm. she did. And that was. Well, this invested it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Helm Street. <laughs> And I really appreciate that because that's what enabled me to make the right choices for the film is that she truly trusted me with this entire film and to hire the right people and to bring on the right producers and the right partners. And I think that this film could have gotten ruined so many different ways at so mm. many different times. And I, I really mm -hmm. am appreciative for being able to make those decisions that I think led us down the right path. But it's a hard, it's hard. It's an emotionally driven sci-fi ish ghost story where the ghosts aren't really scary mm. because I don't think ghosts are actually scary and I'm going to tell you that right at the beginning mm -hmm. and it's like it's a hard it, it it's an interesting one and I to kind of have to sell and so I think that was the trick of why you know maybe a lot of other people wouldn't have considered it so once you once you had the money did you did you then look for producers or did you go straight to cast um because you know you've got Karen Gillan you've got some great leads yeah. in this like how, how did that process happen yeah Katie Parker yeah Katie Parker yeah Rahul Colley oh, yeah. I love them so much um yeah. no I had a I had been working with uh Derek Bechet and Narne Hakopian uh, I had met years before before on a project called Bitch uh Mariana yes. Polka's film uh yeah and we had really gotten on and so they were always aware of it. And so I was talking to them and working on the script as this was happening. And so it, none of us ever thought it was actually gonna happen. I was like, so I found this investor who's never invested in films before in Florida. He really <laughs> wants to make a film and she just, and they said, okay, well, do we have to get a sales team or this or that? And I was like, no, she's just gonna give us all the money. And <laughs> and that just doesn't happen. You know no, what I mean? So, happen, yeah. so they just didn't believe me. And so they were still doing their own things, but it was the pandemic <laughs> and then it just, it actually happened. So we, we did that. And then what's nice about that is we were able to go out to actors with, no, this is actually happening. We actually have the money and we're going to go and we're going to go in this window. Mm. Um, and greenlit so movies, tell you what, you say that to an agent, you say that to an actor, crew, it's greenlit, we are going this day. What a difference it makes then. Well, we might mm. want to make this at some point, which is why it's also always good to set a date. You mentioned, yeah. just quickly on that, you mentioned there you had like the investor was happy to put the money and did you know what budget you were playing with though because that's always the tricky bit when you you write a film you're like well it could be yeah. this little or it could be this big you know you, you it's oh, a difficult yeah. one 
No, I, I always knew it had to be under one million, uh, just because first time mm-hmm. feature director and and the risky subject matter. And it was always one that I knew that we could do it for that, because mm-hmm. I knew mm-hmm. again the style that I was trying to accomplish with this was I can just hire a DP who I we can do handheld, we can go on the road, we had a crew of 17, like, because I've shot so many films, because I know how to crew up, I didn't also go to my producers and say, hey, I'd like to make this. I went to them with a list of the crew, I went to them with the days and how I wanted to accomplish it. Of course, all that shifts as you, you know, the reality comes into play, but most of that crew is the crew that's on the film. Because I've worked so long, you know, Daria Derman, who did our costumes, makeup, and Mm -hmm. hair on the road, (laughs) <laughs> and appears as Nurse Allah at the end. Uh, Amazing! Yeah. So like, I love a good cameo. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's like it—it it was one of those types of things. But I, you don't do that unless you know. I knew Daria. I knew what she could accomplish. I knew that she was able to do this, and I knew that we could set it up the right way. Brett Bachman, mm. my editor, he was on the road with us. He's the clerk who checks them into the first motel, as well. Another cameo, <laughs> as you can tell. This is you know when you have a very small cast and crew, yeah, and you kind of use what you got. Yeah, especially in the it pandemic. Gets, it gets people involved as well. Yeah. Like it's it's a fun thing for them to be not just a crew member. It's like we're, we're actually, you know, we're the other side of the camera. It, it's a nice kind of thing to offer people. And, and I think you also with a with a film like this where there's, there's a, you know, a, a, the budget's under a million, you've got to choose the right crew that are suited to shooting this kind of movie as well. I suppose that's important rather than getting someone off com- commercials that's used Correct. to huge crews, etc. Yeah, and I got the right people who understood it. You know, Brett Bachman, who does much bigger films and projects now, I've known for years. We've done, he did The Party's Just Beginning. He's done several mm-hmm. shorts with me. So... We had that relationship, so I also knew that out of with having a crew of seventeen, I also brought my editor, which everybody thought I was crazy. But because yeah. I knew we were never going to be back in those places again, he was. I was seeing basically. I wasn't seeing dailies. I was seeing scenes by the next morning. Like he was cutting every single night, and so I could wow. be like, and he would be like, "You have to get a picture of this sign, like, or else I can't cut this together." And I was like, "Great, we're still here. Let's run out thir- twenty minutes and let's go grab the That's sign." That's perfect. Right? Yeah, it makes such a difference. It made such yep. a difference and also made me feel much more secure. I remember he had a cut of the beginning and I was so nervous. I didn't want to watch it. Didn't want to watch it the first three days. And finally he made me. He's like, you need to watch this. And I watched it and I was like, oh, shit, it works. I was like, okay, I can keep going. It's a movie. Thank <laughs> hey God. Okay. They're working. Their chemistry is great. And it also allowed me to look at, because he was dropping it in, you know, we were basically shooting an order. I was making changes to my direction, seeing where we had come from and seeing kind of how their emotions were building. I was actually able to kind of shape it as we went because of shooting mm. in order, which was really nice for me to be like, you know what, yeah. we're, let's not get to the peak yet. Let's hold back a little bit. Let's let's do that. So and then working with Katie and Rahul, I just I love them so much. They were so game. They were so wonderful. They worked with one another beautifully. And I, I'm I am so grateful because honestly, this film lives or dies on their performances. Uh, it does, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they really had to bring it, in, and they did. And they really did. They um, did. The other They're cast, so the other cast member, which obviously might have helped, uh, is Karen Gillan. Yeah. Um, obviously, you worked with her before. Um, the part is just beginning, which she directed and you yep. produced. So obviously, you had mm-hmm. that relationship to say, "Oi, I produced your movie. You're gonna be in my movie." <laughs> I mean, was there some of that? I mean, why not? You know, it's all this. This business is about if you get on with people and you ask for favors, they they will come back and say sure. Especially with the script being so great. Yeah, I loved. I mean, Karen's Karen was a huge one who read this and she's like, "You have to make this. This is like so." It wasn't just that I asked her, it was her and Rose McIver. Rose McIver was actually a big reason why I finally finished this script, which was the year before COVID. Uh, I produced a short for her, Nice Ride, uh, that Katie Parker was starring in, by the way. And I saw Katie. So that's how you met, right. Well, actually, I met her 10 years earlier. I've known Katie for a decade. I saw her in a reading of a Flanagan project that never went. And I was like, she's really good. But then I saw her in Nice Ride and I was like, wow, she's grown. She has that depth. She has that level. So that's where I really wanted her to play Rose is after I saw her working on that. But I was talking to Rose McIver after that. We were having a drink and she's like, what do you really want? And I was like, I have this little movie. And she was like, <laughs> and I, she's like, can I read it? And I was like, I haven't finished the script. And she's like, I'm going to an iZombie convention uh, next week <laughs> in Hawaii. Come with me and just lock yourself in a hotel room every single day and, and do it. And I was like, mm-hmm. and I accepted the challenge. So every single day she would go off a door horror convention and I would sit in this hotel room and write and write and write and then in the evenings we'd go and we'd do something together and 
that was it. I finished it in like six days. Finally, like after oh, all this it. time of trying to like play mm-hmm. with pieces and all the rest of it, I had a script, and that's what allowed me to go to investors, to go to produ- to all of that stuff. And it was her being like, "You can do this," and I think I needed somebody to say that. What a joy to have someone who believes in you like that as well. Yeah. I know. And then they all showed up, literally, like. Karen showed up, Rose showed up, like they were all there in the film and I loved having them and it was so much fun to work with them as actors. They're just so experienced and they're so good. And I just remember being with them on set and being like, oh shit, this is like big time. <laughs> you know, they're my friends, <laughs> but I'm working with big time actors. It was really fun. Yeah. Karen and I were both nervous. Yeah, yeah, you must have been. How was it directing then? Because it's, it's directing your peers sometimes can be daunting when you haven't done a feature before and people know you haven't done a feature. So they suddenly, you feel as a director, you suddenly go, oh, hang on, am I? You, you always feel like a fraud. We, that never goes away. Yeah, but the fact is something. you're now directing, you know, uh, expertly excellent actors, couldn't think of a good word there, who, you know, they know their craft. <laughs> Top talent. Big time. They know what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and talk us through that. Talk us through how you actually did get over that and how you actually did direct them on set. Well, it was really, I mean, honestly, with Rose McIver, having her on set, uh, we made a couple of tweaks to the character that were so perfect when I was watching her perform. And it was, it was actually the last line that she says to her right before because I really wanted the intention of the line to be just more or less get your shit together, Rose. But what mm. Rose hears is you're never going to fix it, you know, you're a fuck up forever. And what she's saying is actually you can get it together. And so finding that line and that balance, and I had overwritten that part. And I remember we just kind of talked about it and we just brought it down to like one sentence and she just nailed it. And it was because I was overwriting because I was trying to get so much out Mm. and her eyes did it all for me. And I was like, this is fantastic. And the other thing about Rose McIver, she's so aware. She knows the lenses. She knows the camera. She knows everything. And I remember being thinking that she was very good on the day. When I went to edit her, edit the scene together, I realized how great she was. That she had given right. me all these different options that I could put together these, this single and this single. How she had, con- I was like, damn. She was damn. editing while she was acting. And she was giving me all the options that I would, I could make the scene into anything I wanted. I could, I could edit that scene mm-hmm. forever. It was, there was so much there. So I was very grateful for her. And then with Karen... And honestly, with Karen, it was just really fun. And she was also, I wanted to do a single take of that opening monologue. And she was just like, that's also such a mean thing to do because it's a two page monologue. So it was also bringing her yes. on and being like, <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. Um, and she so, she set the tone for the movie and I always knew that she would. And I was really grateful to have somebody of her gravitas to come in and handle mm. that. And we were both nervous. And then after about two takes, we were just playing. It was just really fun. So, so when you when you sort of go into the preparation with, with an actor, I mean, you, you you talked about discussing, which is always just asking questions. What what is the sort of prep for you with with actors? Do you like to send over thoughts? Do you like to just sort of see what they come up with first in terms of the script? Do you talk through scenes? What's that kind of process like? It's a very once they come on board individual process for each actor, and I really I always start with a general conversation and then kind of in, invite them to dive in more. Katie, uh, I think we went through every single line together. We talked about the intentions, the meanings, like deep dive. Uh, Katie loves getting into it and getting into the thoughts and feelings and everything. Rahul was a more, I think Rahul's more ma- macro, she's more micro. So she wants to know like mm. why I put like a comma in this sentence. He wants right. to like <laughs> talk about the- How could I play this comma? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Whereas he's more of the overall arc. He's like, how do I get, yeah. I want to start there. How do I end there? Yeah. Yeah, yes. like we yeah. really yeah. focused on Teddy, on where he started, on where he was going, mm. how he got there, the backstory between him and his father. Like we really talked about everything outside of the script much more Mm -hmm. than the script itself. And so we talked about all that and then he brought it on the day. And he also, I have to say, like he read the script and he understood Teddy kind of intrinsically just right from jump. jump. Uh, And he, he, I had, I'd hidden all these little things that I was planning on explaining. And he was like, this is this, huh? This is this, huh? I was like, yeah, he was reading subtext. He wasn't, he, you know, he got the text, but he understood the subtext immediately. And so that was just really fun in terms of creating that character with him and, and watching him bring that to life and allowing for space where sometimes I would want him to be exactly on book and other times he's so much more funny than I am. I'm just like, <laughs> what what else do you got? Like, you know, give me your best. Yeah. yeah. 
That's amazing. And look, we know you've got to go. We've got to let you carry on with your wonderful press you're doing at the moment for next exit. And you should be very, very mm. proud. Uh, finally, what um, slight bit of advice that maybe you'd give your younger self, but also for someone out there who is about to go and direct a feature and what you learnt for your next feature moving forward? Yeah. I would say all the anxieties and all the fears that you have aren't going to help you actually make this film. So, mm. uh, you know, worrying isn't working, somebody once told me. So don't worry mm. about what's going to happen. Focus on the work that you have to do. And try not to look at the entire film. You look at every single day. What am I trying to accomplish yeah. today? What is important today? And, and accomplish that day. Don't try, to, don't try to put the whole film in your head. You know, you do the work... Uh, and then you just break it into pieces and you focus on each piece at a time. Amazing. Very good advice. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much. This has been... Yeah, it's been a lovely chat. Really lovely chat. Really it's, appreciate your time. It's been congrats. great, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for taking the time and, and just for supporting this film. I know it's a, it's this little, weird, interesting, introspective ghost story and it just it means <laughs> the world to me. So thank you. Absolute pleasure. Oh, you. You've done brilliantly, honestly. It's it's super film. What a debut, honestly. Great. Amazing. Great. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Look forward to chatting for your next one. Absolutely. Yeah. Chat then. All right. Yeah. See you later. Take bye care. Bye. Cheers, Marley. Bye bye. Bye. So there you have it, Marley Elfman. What a wonderful person she is. Um, you can go out there, make your film, find the right collaborators, go to those film festivals, learn from producing, learn from being on set if you want to be a director. I really like what Marley said there about worrying, doesn't work. It's so true. Write what you want to write. Believe in yourself, believe in your project, find the right people and go make it. Uh, or at least take steps towards that this week. We will see you Tuesday when we have Nathaniel Martello White talking about his brand new film, The Strays. That's a fun one. We will see you then. Take care, everyone.